All right, good morning. So I want to give you a couple of updates. Uh, one is uh, next week we're going to have a guest speaker. His name is Ed Gross, Dr. Ed Gross. And I would encourage everyone to be here. Don't think this is a time to miss. This is a time to be here. Uh, one of the most profound things that he said, which I felt like I was right along with him, is that there is a big difference between calling yourself a Christian and calling yourself a disciple. Let that one sink in. There is a huge difference between saying, I'm a Christian versus saying, I'm a disciple. The Bible and Jesus talked about being a disciple, being a disciple, being a follower, follower after him. So we're going to be doing that and the next week. The week after that, we're going to start off a series in Deuteronomy. And it's going, to be, it's, going to, it's going to be intense, but it's going to be good. But I hope that it would encourage you. And today, you want to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40, please. Open them up. And as you're doing so, I want to pray as people sort of come back in here from dropping their kids off. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, we like sheep have all gone astray, each to our own ways. God, it is no secret the propensity that we, that I have to look to my own strength, our own strength, to look to what we have, to look at what we've done and create an image of a little G God in our own lives. And God, we see, we're going to see, and history shows time and time again where we look to ourselves and look to other gods and look away from you. And Lord, all you want to do as we've sung is to bless us. You want us to trust you you want us to die to ourselves so that we can truly have agape love and walk in freedom and live in the tree of life. Lord, I pray that our eyes would be fixed on Jesus, that our eyes would be fixed on the tree of life, that our eyes would be fixed on the Lord God Almighty. You, O oh God, is who we worship and who we give all glory and renown. And Lord, when we don't, quickly remind us. We thank you that your word holds true yesterday, today, and forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in a quick preface, in Isaiah 39, many authors say that the Isaiah is split up in different sections. This starts off a a different section, and literally it comes after in Isaiah 39 where it talks about the King Hezekiah showed all his wealth and riches to the enemy. Look at what we've done. Look at what we've accomplished. Matter of fact, look in our vaults and see all the gold. Look at all the treasures we have amassed. What a great and strong and rich country we are. And the prophet came to him and said, guess what? Now that you've shown them, they're going to own it someday. They're going to own all that you've shown. They're going to own it all. And you are going to become exiles. The prophetic word. I personally, and, and I, I want you, I don't care what you think, and it's just like you can view it as my own thing. I feel that we as a country and as a church have gone, look at what we've done. Look at what we've amassed. Look at, 
Look at what we have to offer. And I want to say, as a country, we have have not much to offer. Almost number one in sex trafficking and production of underage sex videos. Number one in fatherlessness. Number one. Our dollar holds less value today than it did a month ago. But on the dollar we have in God we trust. But I think it would be more appropriate for many of us to say in money we trust, in wealth we trust, in riches we trust, in prosperity we trust, in everything going well we trust. And God, we want to trust you when everything is taken away because then we are brought to that place. But I want to tell you, that's not the only thing that happens in life. If you're not there yet, you might be disappointed in your ideals. Maybe you started off very idealistic about how you thought your life is going to be. I think most, not all, but most young people have this vision. Anyone have that vision of pie in the sky? Oh, just three of you? Liars. Liars. God's going to rebuke you. All these things that, that you thought that you were going to do. Disappointed romances, disappointed careers, disappointment in people that you trust, and ultimately disappointment in ourselves. Look at how I failed. I could make you a litany of failures in my life. I'm not going to do that today. I know many of you, and the ones I don't know, I'm sure you can make a litany, a big list of failures in your life. When all human hopes have let us down, maybe then we'll be ready for the real salvation that exists. When you've given up on trusting people, when you've given up on trusting things, when you've given up on trusting other gods, other things, your job, your 401k, you looked at that late, I don't know. I mean, it's just like, whew, you know, what? Well, there it is. Some up, some down, whatever. If that is where our trust is, we get disappointment. Isaiah predicted the fall of Babylon, and guess what? It took place in 586 B.C. So I'm going to pop a picture up here. Just a quick, I, I'll, I'll slowly share. That's a, don't look at the guy. Don't look at him. But I am standing on Mars Hill, standing on it. And behind me is the Acropolis. That's the big thing of rock. And on top of it is the Parthenon. That Parthenon was being built when the Israelites were taken into captivity in the construction of this. The Israelites were being taken by Babylon. You can take that picture off now. Please. I don't want to stare at it forever. <laughs> Alan's heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? <laughs> Elders, we're going to have a meeting with Alan after the church today. Everyone say goodbye to Alan. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> In exile, can you imagine what it's like to lose everything. Some of you might know that to some degree. Can you imagine what it's like to, to be prideful in all that your country is amassed? Showing your enemies, look at how, how much we've got. Swept off into exile. God's people were defeated, bitter, disillusioned, and you know where they went to? It's where I went to a year ago and a little over. God failed me. God failed me. You ever said God failed you? You ever felt like God's failed you? Let's be real here. Let's not act like all, we're not all, woohoo, Christians. Happy, clappy all the time. Life is difficult. I missed that. Did anyone hear that? 
He's failed himself more times than God has failed you. I, yes, sir, I agree with that. Matter of fact, in Isaiah 40, and we're going to get to the text mostly, but in 27, it says this, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and, and my right is disregarded by my God? The Israelites felt left by God. They felt disenchanted and broken because they could not believe that what they had amassed was all gone. Gone. Anything that we have right now could be gone in a blink of an eye. If there's nothing I learned on my trip, let's just start off with Athens. Guess what? They fell. Guess who came over and built in Athens and actually built a forum? The Romans. The Romans thought they had it all together. They built a forum in Athens. They were enlarging their tent stakes. You ever read that being taken out of context? We want to enlarge our tent stakes. We're going to do, we're going to be bigger and better. And Rome did that and they grew and they grew. Guess what happened? They fell. Civilization after civilization after civilization has fallen. And what we forget, we have such a short, young time period in America. We think that we are going to, that we are some profoundly blessed, and we are, but that we are so blessed that we can never receive recompense for our sinfulness. God is saying to us, He has not abandoned you. Actually, your best days are still ahead. Do you believe that? I do. Ultimately, we know where the best days are going to be. God's purpose for you is greater and His grace is greater than you can even imagine today. That maybe you've never sensed. He's coming to save us. He's coming to save you. Let this hope fill your sails. So I want you to think about something. We are the receivers of God's promises. Yes? We receive God's promises if we... Now, we can quote them, but unless we receive them, it's a different thing. We walk in God's promises but we are at the same time carriers of the problem. So we're all bipolar. Not downplaying being bipolar. Don't don't hear that. Not making fun of it. But on one side, we you know we're just like, man, I am a receiver of God's promises. I'm a receiver of God's wealth. I'm a receiver of God's blessing. I've been a receiver of this. He has brought me from mud and whatever. And then on the other side, I am the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I look and I judge everything. I question. I look at myself. I don't like what I see in the mirror. I do what I want to do in my own mind. I become my own God, and I do what I want, thinking that it's all going to work out, and God's still going to bless me. Woo! And then when he doesn't, and he pulls his covering back, And we feel the heat. It can get worrisome. But here's the good news. In Christ, we are all receivers of God's covenant promises to us. In Christ, God has promised, no matter how unfaithful you are, that he will always be faithful. Some of y'all should be thankful for that. No matter how unfaithful you are. I mean, we talked in men's group yesterday about Hosea and the idea of an unfaithful spouse over and over and over again. And God keeps his faithfulness. God has kept and will keep his covenant promise to you and me. That is great news. So we don't rest on our performance We rest on his promises. We rest on his covenant that he will take whatever it is we have squandered and he has the power 
to redeem the years and to bless you right now, no matter what your past looks like. That was the same problem he had to the Israelites. He gave the same promise he gave to them. So I'm going to want to tell you four things today. The first one, in Isaiah 40, uh, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. The first one is going to be the occasion of his comforting promise. Or you could also say his covenant promise. If you're more feel better about comfort, then use that. If you feel better about covenant, I sort of like covenant, but however you want to do it. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her welfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The question is, do we sin? Yes. I know most of you. The answer is yes. Do we sin? Yes. Do we suffer for it? Yes. We do. Does God ever leave us? No. That's a covenant promise. That is a comforting promise. So if you focus on yourself, you focus on your knowledge, to to paraphrase what Pam was saying, your knowledge of good and evil and how you think you line up, you focus on that, you are going to get trapped in that knowledge of good and evil, and you will be deceived, and you will begin to get puffed up and go, you know, I'm pretty good. I got it all together. But if you follow after God's covenant promises, no matter where, no matter what happens, he has promised that he is always with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Yet, at the same time, you and I will pray, excuse me, pay when we fail to follow his plan. And that's something we're going to see in Deuteronomy. There are blessings and cursings. There are promises to follow and also not so many good things if you don't follow. And this is where we fall. So we see the occasion. God is coming to them in their exile, in their captivity, in their slavery. The second thing we're going to find in verses 3 through 5 is the the content of his comforting or covenantal promise. Verse 3, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Think of that imagery. In my desert, this is where Isaiah 58 is just talking about, in dry places. Who here would want to go and build a road in the desert? I wouldn't invest in that, right? It's like, that doesn't sound like a good plan. But it's saying, make God, make a road because God is going to come through your desert experience and he is going to prove the content of his promise. He is going to prove that he is faithful. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, I can say this, that this is an already but not yet thing. Will we ultimately see all the mountains in our life made low? No, not all of them. Nope. But one day... One day, it was what we all hoped for when the king of glory returns, that we can see and we can finally just go, yes, I am safe. You want to have a safe place? It's with God Almighty. It's in under the shadow of his wings. We will, have, we will be in a place where, in a kingdom where there is no front door because there is no enemy. That's the ultimate promise, but the promise is also for you now in the sense of that he is with you. So God is saying three things. One, the king is coming. The king is coming. And on that day, there's a, there's a couple ways we can be found when the king comes. One, we can be found not ever trusting in him 
and trusting in ourselves and going, I understand things better than God can. And he's going to look at you just like going, I never knew you. Two, you could be living as a Christian but not a disciple. And I I feel as though, and I I don't know where it's going to go next week, but I, I want to say that I feel as though that if we've been living just as a Christian, a happy, clappy Christian, instead of a disciple, that I think there's going to be some level of, of sadness. I don't know what it's going to look like. But I always remember some of the youth group people are here, that song that's like, we fall down and we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of his mercy and love. And I'm just like, what if we don't have anything to lay down? Because we were doing what we wanted to do. God says he gives us over to what we want. He did that at Babel. Oh, you want to follow other gods? Go ahead. There's time and time again in Scripture, there's very few people in Scripture that we don't really see the fall. Very few, ultimately Jesus. But when we choose to do our own way and we pay the price, we blame God. But God is saying the king is coming and then ultimately The third version can be this. I have decided to follow Jesus today. I'm not talking about yesterday. I have decided to follow Jesus today. Going back to some things you've heard me say before, there is grace for today, yes? Tomorrow is too much for any of us in this room. You might not feel it, but I just want to tell you, you're going to find out. There is grace for today for you. No matter what your circumstance or situation, there is grace for today. And when you trust, <coughs> excuse me, when you trust God in that way, He will sustain you. Two, God will accomplish His purpose. God will accomplish His purpose, not yours. No, no amens on that. We don't like that. You know how the prayers are? Dear God, please make this a beautiful day. Please keep everyone safe. Let the birds be chirping as you're writing your prayer to God. Pray my business would grow. I pray my kids would just be sinless like me. It's God. But in reality, the prayer should be, God, I am broken and I'm in need of you today. Fill me. Fill me to overflow. And then what you know I'm going to say, right? Pour, pour me out. Fill me to overflow and pour me out. I still say it, I know I said it earlier, but not to most of y'all, but I still say that that is how we live our Christian life. Get filled, pour out. Get filled, pour out. We don't come to church. We shouldn't come to church just excited to be, I just got to be filled. I got to be fed. To be fed because it's been a drought this week. Woe with me. No, it's like every day, filled. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Filled, be filled, be filled. Then guess what? Dump that cup over. Love your neighbor as yourself. Pour it out, pour it out, pour it out. God's coming back, and he's faithful. And when it says that God will accomplish his purpose, what's he really saying? He's talking about our upheaval and bring this to a place of true repentance. Not halfway repentance. Not like going to McDonald's and splitting your, your sweet tea up. You know, you're going you're to take... 50% sweet, because if you ever do that thing 100%, you got, you're in another level. That wasn't nice. <laughs> I saw that. But you split it up. It's not like going halfway. He's looking, and he's talking for us a new moral topography. Like we live in a different realm that we're going to live differently. A new landscape for us socially, together as a family. 
He's looking for us to bring a disruptive, a radical, as Pam sort of led to, a radical love of evangelism that's just going to wreck doors open and fly them open and say, this is what my God is and this is what he's done for me. And dear Lord, I can't wait for you to meet him. But I fear that most of us are trying so hard to be filled. Now, I got I to say, most of y'all know I went on a cruise. For the first three or four days, I ate way too much. And I don't know if you've been there before, but there comes a time when you are too filled that food is not appealing. I don't care if you drop a filet mignon in front of me. I looked at all the food, and I'm like going, I have got to fast on this cruise. I took a day of fasting because I was miserable, because I was consuming. And I sort of justified it because, look, I walked all over Rome, and I lost some weight there, and I sweat a lot. You know, I ate too much. But some of us consume knowledge, consume, 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 and don't worry about being poured out. To get a little gross, you know how much of a blessing it is to be able that we're blessed, to, our body allows us to go to the bathroom? And that's not a great picture for some of you, but guess what? We all do it. But when we can't be poured out of, <laughs> it's gross, there's an issue. There's a problem. Ray Orland said this. He is saying that lifting and lowering and leveling and smoothing are necessary to the kingdom of Christ. He is talking about depression being relieved, pride being flattened, troubled personalities becoming placid, that's speaking to me. I'm a troubled personality. Remember Lake Placid? Not always Placid, though. Anyway. And difficult people becoming easy to get along with. So when it's talking about a flattening, there should be a change because the King and glory is coming back and we have a hope that's in the gospel that we are being refined and being changed and being encouraged that people around us can see that there's something different. And then we all just give glory to God. We're like, praise you, God, for that. The third thing is going, the glory of the Lord will be revealed to this whole world. And that will be when we, oh, he's going to do it. Let me just go back to, that's, he's going to accomplish that. But do you want to be a part of showing that revelation to the world? He can do it without you. Do you believe that? Guess what? He will. But in us, we should desire so much that we want to carry that light to the world. That we are living the filling and the pouring out, the filling and the pouring out so much, filling and pouring out, that we are able to tell someone our testimony, not say what happened a hundred years ago, or what happened 30 years ago, or 20 years ago. Good Lord. The third one is the certainty. How you and I can be certain about God's comforting or covenantal promises. Verse 6, a voice says, cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. The only thing we've got if our trust is in people, or our hope is in people, or our hope is in an organization, or our hope is in our spouse, or our hope is in our children, or our hope is in our finances, that stuff can be removed, and ultimately the only hope we have is in Jesus. 
That's it. That's where he wants to take us. That's the certainty of where he's taken us. The word of God will stand forever. And ultimately get to the place where we begin to actually trust him. That is the process of sanctification. And I for one can tell you, it is not a fun process. But I'm grateful for it. Lastly, is the spreading of his comforting promise. Verse 9. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald of good news, lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arms rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. He's promised to pick you up. Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist in Germany, a well-renowned one. He wrote a beautiful book. He spent roughly five years in a concentration camp. And he said, in, in the end, only thing that mattered, and when it was gone, it was all over his hope. When you lose hope, you might find yourself right now in a position where you are lacking hope. My hope, my hope and my prayer today is that you will embrace the comfort of Isaiah 40. That God is faithful. He is going to comfort you. He's, going to, he's given you a covenant promise to never leave you or forsake you. But we will increase in our joy of spreading hope. So, I forgot this update. So, we just finished the front part of the well. So, that means as soon as the plumbing's connected, our ice maker will be there, coffee machines, and, you know, those of you who, especially the men I know, running back and forth will be happy about that. But the goal is not to have a finished little place. The goal is that the well will become a place of hope, will become a place of healing, that we can feed those who don't have food, that we can spiritually feed those who are, who are dying from lack of sustenance, that we can be there, that you all can use it as a place. That is our ultimate goal, so that we can spread the gospel. We can do it in a way that we can just trust God and we can walk with Him and we can be comforted in Him. And ultimately, we just get to a place where you and I Trust God absolutely. Just well, no matter what. And I believe that we can go to that place. I don't know that I believe that for a while completely. I almost, I'm afraid I'm a, like somehow, this, I don't want to lie, I don't want to deceive in any way, but I think right now in this moment, I'm in a place where I absolutely trust God with my future and yours. And that's where he wants us.